So oh. everybody, super excited to have Eris with us for the finale today. Uh, it is a living history talk. So without further ado, turning it over you to you to tell us about you. Okay. That so thank you so much. I'm 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 very grateful for the opportunity to, to present. And and as I was thinking about my talk, um, you know, I kind of uh, thought about the challenge of this sort of form, right? Which is you know, we're, you know, we're biophysicists and, and, you know, we in many ways share a great deal in common. Um, and so I, I wanted to give a talk today that was maybe a little bit different. It's not really so much about, you know, here is the roadmap by which I became a biophysicist, but here is something about me that I, I might not share in a normal setting or in a typical setting, but which I think, you know, is something I derived some insight from. And, and I think is something I think about, which it's not obvious that I would, right? And it's not that I'm unique in that I, I think about something that's not obvious, you know, all of us have non-obvious inspirations, um, but, uh, but they're different, right? And the, they're what make us different as scientists and as thinkers. And so I wanted to share one of those, you know, it's kind of hard to tell you all of the different folks that inspired me. So I, I thought I'd share one of them. Um, and uh, this is actually a painting that's hanging in my, in my living room. It's by a painter named Michal Meron. Um, and she uh, is a painter in, in the Venice ghetto. There's actually a painting of the Venice ghetto. I don't know if people sort of know what, what that is, but for, for about you know 400 years, um, the Jews in Venice. I'm Jewish, um, and uh, the Jews in Venice had to live in in this like little area of uh, it's you know kind of two square blocks. It's Venice, very beautiful canals, all of that sort of thing. But two of these little islands, right, kind of the size of two little city blocks, is where the Jews had to live, and and they. Uh, they could not be out of the ghetto at night. So they sort of lived inside, but they could be out of the ghetto during the day, which, you know, uh, all told, you know, for, for the time was uh, quite progressive. Um, but at night they had to be, they had to be inside the ghetto and, and people lived there for, uh, for hundreds of years. And, you know, before I went to graduate school in, uh, in science, I actually was in a PhD program in, in history. And I was working on a PhD, I eventually wrote a master's thesis um, about uh, Leone de Modena, um, who's, who's one of the people who lives, uh, who lived in the Venice ghetto. Now, I, I should note that actually, um, there's probably one inhabitant of the Venice ghetto that all of you have heard of, um, quite likely, which is the character Shylock from, from The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. Um, he's a fictional character. Um, sort of an extraordinary character in a lot of ways, deeply problematic character in a lot of ways, regardless of fictional character. Um, you know, uh, no one vaguely like Shylock, uh, you know, really lived in the Venice ghetto, although there were money lenders there. Anyway, um, in point of fact, actually, the most famous actual person who actually lived in the Venice ghetto is probably Leona de Modena. Um, he was the chief rabbi there for a while. Um, in the uh, 16th and early 17th century. So, you know, about 400 years ago. Um, and, uh, and he was an interesting guy. And I think about him a lot, which is weird because I would venture to say that no one in the field of biophysics thinks about him at all. Um, and so in that respect, he's kind of one of these non-conserved sequences in, in my intellectual DNA, right? Like the PhD, well, kind of everyone did the PhD, you know, this kind of paper, that kind of paper, this kind of course, that kind of course, that's in all, in all our DNA, that's conserved. But there's these sort of unique elements. And for me, he's a unique element. So I want to tell you a little bit about, um, about him and, uh, you know, my, my first attempt to write a PhD thesis, which was in point of fact, ultimately not a success, I suppose. Um, so hopefully the slides will advance. 
Anyway, this painting is actually kind of nice. It, it sort of shows you different stories from his life. I really like the work of Michal Maron, who works to this day in the Venice ghetto, which is sort of like a little kind of Jewish quarter in the city still, even though obviously the, the rules are, are not what the rules were. And anyway, so this little, little part of the painting sort of shows you him. He's young. He doesn't have a beard. Um, he's getting married. It's very, it's very nice. Uh, here's, here's a little uh, little part later. It's sort of showing him, you know, leading the congregation. He's, you know, the most prominent uh, rabbi in all of Italy, depending on your measure. Um, anyways, leading them in uh, in a blessing. This is a uh, this is sort of nice. This is actually showing you a building. These are buildings that are there, right? This is the uh, you know Beit Midrash, the house of study, where you know, where he studied Bible and Talmud and all kinds of other subjects. Um, this is a really interesting little vignette from his life. Here you can see him playing cards. So he had a lot of high moral ideas. Also though, he was kind of an inveterate gambler, um, which was not, um, and he was not a very good gambler. So he was constantly losing all of his money, which was actually kind of good because it was a great inspiration for him to like go out and do creative acts, for remuneration. Um, and however you feel about that, um, it is often an inspiration for, uh, for very creative figures. So anyway, so that's, those are some little vignettes from his life. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of show you this. So, so this was, uh, you know, actually the, the work I was writing on, um, you know, with this uh, sort of abortive dissertation. Um, I mean, it was great. I, I enjoyed writing it. I ended up writing a couple hundred pages, but I just realized that I probably wanted to be a scientist and not a historian. Anyway, so so Modern actually liked to write these outrageously heretical works. You know, like, I don't know how you feel about your personal religion, but, uh, you know, you know, on the one hand, he was like the chief rabbi, and on the other hand, he's writing these outrageously heretical works, you know, with like crazy, wild, amazing ideas. But of course, he, he realizes that he can't um, he can't publish them in his own name because that would be an enormous scandal. So what he would do is he'd write one of these like works and then he'd like write a rebuttal of it under his own name. And then he'd publish the two together. He'd be like, here's my rebuttal of this crazy work that someone showed me. But he's actually writing kind of the crazy heretical works himself. It's pretty clear that that's what he really wanted to publish was these crazy heretical works, but he just couldn't get away with it if he did it under his own name. He also wrote you know, like just extraordinarily beautiful things. And I wanted to just give an example of this because I think people can appreciate it, right? I'm talking, talking about, you know, like 400 years ago and like, again, you know, we've heard many beautiful things about Italy uh, tonight, but I'm talking about 400 years ago, you know, some Talmudist and, you know, what he's writing about. You can say, well, why, why is this even interesting? So I want to leave you with something that's kind of like interesting from, from his life that you can appreciate, you know, you can appreciate, you know, his unique intellectual flavor. So um, on the death of one of his, you know, his own personal rabbis, he thought, how can I mark this? And he came up with the insane idea of writing essentially what people call now like kind of a homophonic, um, you know, transliteration. There's really no word for the form because there's so few good examples of it. This may very well be the best example of it in history. So it is a series of syllables, essentially, that are meaningful in two languages. Um, so you can read it as the sounds and interpret them as a Hebrew poem, or you can read the sounds and interpret them as an Italian poem. Now, my Italian is zilch, although my Hebrew is probably okay. Um, my time is zilch, so so this is I have it on good word that this is actually an accurate translation. Um, but anyway, I mean, like you can see, I'll just read like the first two words, like kinashimor, right? Which in Hebrew means you know, kind of mark this lament, keep it close to your heart, you know. Uh, in uh, in Italian, kinasha um, more, whoever is born dies. And it goes on like this. It actually is a like, beautiful iambic pentameter. It's an extraordinary form. No one else could write like this. Um, and who the heck can even read it, right? I mean, how many people, you know, have Hebrew and Italian at that level? Like, nobody. He wrote this because of his own inner diamond, right? And it's this, you know, unique form. It's almost impossible. I've tried to write like this. I, at one point, 
led like this creative writing group. I tried to get everyone to write like this. It's like impossible. It's really hard. Uh, anyway, the whole thing, it's, it's actually a beautiful poem. It's a beautiful lament. And it means actually roughly the same thing. I mean, it's effective in roughly the same way, both in the Hebrew and in the Italian. So, you know, what did I take from this? I mean, here's this guy who, no, you guys have never heard of him. You're a Shylock, right? Of course, Shylock is fictional and kind of like horribly odious, right? But actually, in, in those like two little, you know, two little square blocks to this day, Leona de Modena is the most famous person who ever lived, you know, in those two little, two little blocks of Venice. And how did he do it? Like the stuff that he wrote that was like traditional in some sense, like, yeah, it was impactful, but the things that he did that were extraordinary, he was writing them like pretending it wasn't him. He was writing in, I can't even say a language other people didn't speak, combinations of languages that there was like no readership for, you know, and like, how the hell did that work? Who the heck would have told you that this was a thing to do? Anyway, so, so I would say that there were two things that I kind of have gotten from, there's a lot of things I've got from this, you know, I didn't get a PhD from it, but there's some things I got from this. And I would say, if I wanted to distill them into two things is you have to kind of be yourself intellectually, you know, like he was like looking around at, you know, the situation in his time and uh, thinking thoughts that were very, very, very different, you know, than, than anyone else who was around him, you know, he was just doing his own thing. And he was doing things, you know, because he thought it was beautiful, not because the world around him was going to appreciate it. But the other thing that he did, which was extraordinary, is a prolific guy. He wrote down a lot of stuff. He wrote down a lot of stuff. And a lot of those things found these extraordinary and disparate audiences, you know, because there were kind of great ideas, you know, and it turns out that, yeah, you know, 400 years later, like, you know, we've got the internet, we've got all kinds of things, and he's finding new readers, you know, he's finding new readers through these mediums, through these extraordinary, you know, literary experiments that he did. Um, and I think that these are good ideas. For, for an intellectual, you know, I think that there's, there is a tendency, we all do sort of the same things and so we get used to doing the same things, you know, like you get the PhD, you write a paper in this journal, you know, you, you know, try to solve this sort of problem, then you try to use that sort of data. And someone like this, and you know, that's why I have a painting sort of his life on, on my wall is, you know, amazingly refreshing, you know, just looked at what he wanted to do and did it. And that is something I try to do. And you know, some days you're better and some years you're better, right? And some years you're worse. Um, but that's something that I try to do. And I think, you know, he also did the important, it's not intuitive. It's not intuitive to like write things down when it's like not clear who the readers are. But if you do great work, like work that you feel is great, work that you feel is extraordinary, like if you write it down, people will come, you know, I think, I think they will come. Um, and that is very important. Um, so anyway, so those are some ideas, you know, that I have sort of hanging on my wall, both physically and mentally. And I wanted to, to share them because that's, you know, th those are things that have, have shaped me as a scientist. Also, I mean, yeah, look, you know, if you want to get, you know, tenure in biophysics, you, you do need to go, and, you know, get a PhD and write the papers and those sorts of things. But I, I think that, you know, if, you know, you want to put a smile on, you know, the face of, the people around you, the world of ideas, all of that sort of thing. I think it there is like this other, there is this other aspect to it that we don't always talk about. And, and for me, you know, Leona de Modena's life and, and this painting kind of brings that to the fore. So, so that's sort of what I wanted to talk about today. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. That was so powerful on behalf of the audience. Thank you. Um, throwing the floor open for anybody who has questions, please. Just unmute and go for it. Yes, any questions you have about, you know, 16th and 17th century in Venice, I am your guy. <laughs> All right. Can I, can I? Oh, yes, yes, please. Yeah, um, uh, it, is, it was an amazing talk. Uh, but something that strikes me um, very strongly, I feel right now, is that when you said, like, when you want to pursue, or like, the impression that I got as if, like, um, if you want to pursue a research question or questions that are, the things that excite you the most, um, 
and be yourself and be basically beat yourself intellectually to pursue that not what bothering about what the people think but given the fact that right now research has is so collaborative that you need to have a network um or else it's very hard to judge or sort of have a uh, more um how do i say feedback on your research um my my question doesn't make any sense but what i meant is that like given the fact that um research now is so collaborative that even if you go for uh, any conferences unless you do the work of uh, do the work that other people are all not doing then you are not heard of you are not being heard that much yeah. or you oh, I, I think I think I understand what you're talking. You're saying, look, you know, you're saying this stuff, and it's like this sort of monolithic polar view, right? But like, how can you do that in, in the world? And and I think, look, you know, I'll kind of go back to my guy, right? He's not, you know, it's not everything that he wrote that was extraordinary, you know, and and in some ways he found crazy ways to do this thing, you know, like you know, he'll publish, like, he's like the chief rabbi. He's like one of the most prominent Jews in the world. He's writing crazy heretical work, amazing ideas about the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, things that would upset literally everyone around him, you know, like, you know, they, they don't agree about anything else, but they agree, they don't like that, right? But so he, he, instead of publishing it, he'll like, he'll publish like a rebuttal of it in his own name. And he'll say, I have read this crazy thing. I'm, I'm going to rebut this for you right now, right? And so, you know, so he finds like a, you know, so I don't think you can only be, you know, the sort of polarizing figure. I don't think you can only break all the rules all day long. Like, I think you have to, and I think he did it. Like, it's like, you, you have to find, you know, sort of, you have to figure out what that quantum is of, you know, kind of connecting with others. I mean, you, have, you, have to, you have to be kind to others. You have to, you know, live in the world with others. But at the same time, I think you can't lose sight of these lucid things that are inside of you that are unique to you that are yours, right? You can't lose that. And I think it's so easy to lose that because we're all doing so many things that are similar, right? And so you have to find ways, like paths into yourself, you know, I think in, in some ways and into your own ideas. And that can be challenging because, you know, you live in a world of compromises because, you know, you keep gambling all your money away. I mean, I don't know if you do, right? But, but he did, right? So, you know, so you have these like, you know, sort of real challenges, but like, you know, I think finding paths to your own, to your own voice, right? Your own ideas, I think is, is like an important life quest. Uh, if I can continue with this. Uh, uh, just one yeah. Sorry, Suraj, I want to wrap up with one more question and then have you maybe offline. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's completely fine. Okay, so, so I want to follow up on, the question and your answer to ask specifically about like this amazing act of creating such a body of work for an aspirational audience that may or may not exist in future um and the negotiations you were talking about doing through this jazz and whimsicalness and negotiating with the outside world while doing this would you choose an example, maybe from your own trajectory or somebody else's trajectory with some connection to biophysics where you've seen I mean, that. you know, like, I mean, it's kind of a bit of, um, you know, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just as an extension of this, right? You know, I did work in history and, you know, and sort of dropped out of a history PhD program. And so that sort of shaped me in some ways. And, you know, so then, you know, in like the world of, but I sort of carried that like with me, you know, I carried that with me for a while after, um, and even into science grad school. And so then, you know, suddenly when, you know, there was the, uh, you know, studying genomics and thinking about this idea of like comprehensive data sets that describe a process. And then, you know, like kind of Google started you know, their, their books project where they're like digitizing literally the libraries that every historian kind of reads through. I mean, I don't want to say it's just reading books in the library, there's archives, there's all kinds of primary source material, but you know, they're, they're kind of going through that. And, you know, I said, hey, this is like a road to something that's like, you know, 
my own. You know, actually, when I went to history grad school, I had I, I got to told talk to a friend of mine I was just starting because I was you know did not do my undergrad in, in history, and you know I said, oh, I want to like you know write down mathematical equations that describe historical processes, and uh, you know they just laugh, they just like looked at me for a moment, and they just like laughed and laughed, you know, and. Uh, and that was actually like kind of not possible then. But then like 15 years later, it was actually amazingly possible, right? It was amazingly possible. And it was like the road to that idea, right? But it's not like that idea is not like unique, right? I think, you know, like you just have to hold on to, you know, these these pieces of your own ideas until, until you can explore them. I mean, you know, work on, you know, I, I mean, there's other other pieces of work that were sort of similar, right? It's just like your own, you, know, you have your own idea um and you just have to kind of hold on to it you know you have you have to discover it um and you know maybe make compromises along the way to make it possible for you to rediscover it so yeah no i mean i'm sorry i made it kind of very abstract you know but uh but i think you know i think that intellectual processes are kind of the same i mean the scientific resolute revolution is like relatively new it's like the last 500 years before that there were smart people they're creative people. People put out outstanding intellectual works. People like ourselves, if we were born 800 years ago, would probably be talking about, I don't know, you know, the detailed nature of uh, the Trinity. I don't know. You know, I don't know what we would be doing if we were born, you know, 800 years ago. But we would be, I suspect, kind of getting together, talking about how to, you know, how to share ideas, how to become, you know, intellectually better than we are, how to move forward on that road. And I suspect that there's a lot of these things would actually so with the case, you know, there would be no such thing as bio, as PhDs or biophysics, you know. On that very, very inspiring note, thank you so much again. I'm closing the recording, but conversations remain open.